act, we don't have control over a lot of it. Uh, what we have control over is what happens, what our reaction is to what happens to us. So, you know, some things uh, uh, that happen to us are, are amazing and wonderful. We fall in love or we find a wonderful pet um, or we get to take an amazing trip somewhere. Or we have a really special connection with a friend, like a really meaningful conversation or we're able to volunteer and help someone. So there are lots of ways that we can, you know, that we can we can have have joy and happiness. There are also lots of things that happen to us in life that make us miserable and unhappy and frustrated. I mean, everything from small things like getting stuck in traffic. Does that happen to anyone? Oh my gosh, I live in Los Angeles. It's like completely crazy here with traffic. Or you know, if someone leaves us, uh, someone dies, someone abandons us. Um, you know, there's a lot in life. We lose a job. Um, there's a lot of suffering and pain. There's a lot of bad things that happen to us. And I think, you know, this quote, what it really just symbolizes to me, it's it's something that that my parents quoted to me all the time when I was a kid. And I, I don't know if I quite grasped it until I was an adult, that, you know, our choice is how we take it. Our choice is how we respond. And I see people commenting about things that are negative, that frustrate them. And Fatima, your brother passed away. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, so, you know, our choices in is, <laughs> how about the course starting 20 minutes late? Exactly. Frustrating, right? We didn't have a choice over that. But so our choice was, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to react? How are we going to respond? So we'll be talking a little bit about that today. And one of my quotes, <laughs> to quote myself, is I really feel that um, although we have less control than we'd like in life, we have more power than we know. Does that make sense? Um, so we don't have a lot of control over, you know, who shows up, how the weather is, you know, whether things go exactly the way we want. And yet we have so much power. Um, we have so much power over how we choose to react and respond, how we choose to be in our everyday life. I think um, that a lot of times we give ourselves too little credit for, um, for what's possible in terms of, um, you know, uh, just accepting things as they are, learning to appreciate and feel gratitude, and um, really just being present to what shows up for us, and showing up for others in a way that is authentic and vulnerable, loving, and compassionate. So those are some of the things that I do believe we have control over, and we can talk a little bit more about that. So fundamentally, I think we all have the ability to find joy and happiness inside ourselves, regardless of what is happening around us. At the same time, everything is impermanent. So this is one of the number one principles of happiness in life. So uh, even though we have a choice to feel joy and happiness in us, um, nothing, joy, happiness, sorrow, anger, frustration, is permanent. Right? So um, I actually think that the number one happiness principle is accepting that there are times when we will be unhappy and that we'll be miserable and that we'll be frustrated and we'll be angry and we'll be sad and, and that it's okay for us to have all of those feelings. Someone said, this is quite Buddhist. And yes, I have, there's a heavy Buddhist influence in my philosophy. I can tell you guys a little bit about my own background later if you're curious to hear it. But, um, you know, if you think about it, all you have to think about is your own life, right? So just think about actually the past hour. We can just start there. You don't even have to go more than that. So in the past hour, was there a moment when any of you felt frustrated? I bet any of you guys who tuned in when the class was supposed to start and found that it wasn't going on and started hearing people say, this is a fake class, this isn't going to happen. Um, anybody out there, you want to raise your hand or give me a thumbs up or a smile if you feel like you were frustrated in the last hour? Um, I'd love to hear that. I know I was. I was like, wait a second, is this happening? People are angry at me. Um, I can't do anything about it. I don't have control over this situation, right? Did anybody feel um, happy in the last hour? Has anybody felt some happiness and some joy? Is anybody excited? Someone says they were patient. Dimitri, great. Um, so we go through this range of emotions, right? And this is happening constantly, constantly. Someone said, yeah, the change is constant, right? So we're literally 
Oh, that's nice. Someone did a poll. Okay. I love it. That's great. Were you upset by what happened? Thank you, Nellie, or whoever did that. So what we what we learned to do, and one of the ways that we can really um, tap into this connection to the sense that life is impermanent uh, is through meditation. So I'm a big believer in meditation. Uh, I started meditating. I did my first 10-day silent Vipassana meditation retreat in Northern California in 2007. Uh, and I would love to recommend this to you guys. I will send you the link. Um, you don't have to be Buddhist. Um, you don't have to be of any particular uh, religious background or philosophy. Um, these centers that are SN Goenka centers, I sent you the link there, are located all around the world, literally everywhere in the world. So you can find them wherever you are, I'm sure in India, in Europe, in the US, in South America. And uh, they're free. You pay nothing to go. You're not even allowed to donate until the end of the course. And I really recommend this to people. Someone says it was fun. Okay, I would not use the word fun to describe my 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat. I would say that it was literally the hardest thing that I ever did in my entire life, uh, without a doubt. But it was also the most rewarding. And that sounds kind of cliche, but man, I, I'm telling you, you go, you spend uh, 10 days at a retreat center where you do nothing but meditate um, you, you, you can't take anything with you. You don't, you don't read, you don't write, you don't listen to music. Um, you have no distractions and it's really powerful to spend, um, 10 days alone with nothing but your thoughts. Jagger, thanks so much for chiming in and saying that you did a Vipassana retreat, um, in India. Wow. That's amazing. Great. Good for you. So you can, you can talk about what an experience this was. Why is this a key to finding happiness in life? Why is meditation? You don't have to do a 10 day Vipassana retreat. I'm just recommending it because it's free and they're around the world, globally available to you. Um, but the reason, the number one reason is because you learn to watch your thoughts without any distractions. So you have no one to blame. You have nothing to fixate on for what's going on during those 10 days and what you realize is that you will literally experience every single emotion in the human vocabulary. I mean, you will go through everything. You'll, you'll just go into, you know, some, some trip about something that happened to you in the past and you'll get frustrated and angry. And why did that happen to me? You might start projecting about the future and having fantasies and, um, remembering things, imagining things. And what you realize is that everything is impermanent. Everything comes and goes, everything rises and passes. So once you kind of realize on that, you, you focus a lot on your breath. So that is the, really the Vipassana thing is focusing on your breath, just watching the breath rise and fall. And then you pay attention to the physical sensations that come across your body. So you kind of track the physical sensations coming down from your head to your toes and just watching and observing and noticing anger arises, frustration arises, joy arises, peace arises and everything passes. So if everything is impermanent, then you don't have to get so attached to what happens in a particular moment. And I think this is really a key, really a key to happiness in life. And it doesn't mean you don't get to be unhappy or you don't get to be frustrated. It just means that it's okay. So you kind of allow it, you create more space and you create more space even for the negative feelings, even for the times when you feel sorrow or anger. Um, it's okay, it's okay to allow that too and to know that this too shall pass. So can I be a little more, bit more accepting of just where I am right now? So that's one of the number one happiness principles. I'm gonna go on to the next one and then I'd love to have a discussion about all of this with you guys. The second happiness principle is that, again, we can't control what happens to us in our life, but we can control our reaction. So your reaction to what happens to you is your choice. Not what happens to you, but your reaction to it. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's really interesting when you start to get a little more conscious and develop a little bit of awareness about the power that you have. You know, that quote I said at the beginning where we maybe have less control than we'd like, but we have more power than we know. The power that we have is, is our choice of how to react. And one of the most important things, and another reason why I really think meditation is beneficial, is because 
I often find that if you can just give yourself a few minutes to process and feel and notice and observe and take yourself a step back what's happening to you, then you are able to come to your reaction with, um, with more perspective and more balance and wisdom and often with more compassion and love. So let's think of an example. Does anybody have an example of something that regularly upsets or frustrates that, that you could um, talk about? And Jagger says, respond, don't react. I like that too. Um, yeah, it's more of a response. It's like taking a second to step back. Okay, so Sebastian says your technology crashes. I love that. Thank you, Sebastian. That is something that I still find myself getting so frustrated about. So like your technology doesn't work. You know, you're trying to get on a phone call or Skype and your internet goes down or, you know, the course doesn't start on time. Traffic. I'm not sure I'm saying your, your name correctly, but yeah, traffic. So let's talk about like these things that frustrate us. So, you know, we don't have control. The, the internet goes down, our computer crashes, our cell phone isn't working, we're stuck in traffic. Can you really, there's, right, there's nothing you can do and you find yourself starting to get all agitated and frustrated. So you just take a little bit of a step back, take a breath, observe what's going on and say, wow, Dr. Nelly says frustrating moments are opportunities to practice. Absolutely. These are the exact moments when it's most beneficial for our happiness practice. This is when our happiness practice counts the most. You know, even more so than when we're having a wonderful time with friends or on a hike in nature. But those moments when we're so aggravated and we're so frustrated and things aren't going our way. And I think that um, we all can benefit then from just breathing and taking a little break, taking a little step back and saying, okay, if I don't have control over this, then what is my reaction to it going to be? Am I going to sit here and stew and get angry and feel my heart rate rise and know that my stress levels are through the roof? I'm literally causing damage to my body when this happens. Or am I going to just accept it and say, wow, look, okay, throw the computer. <laughs> That's maybe not going to be the best solution. Um, and, uh, and, and say, okay, so I don't have control over this, so I guess I'm just going to use this time in traffic to make a phone call or to... Um, you know, do some meditation. Being in traffic is a great opportunity to meditate. Um, make a phone call to a loved one if you have a, a wireless handheld system. If your technology crashes, maybe it's an opportunity to step away from the technology and go for a walk outside and breathe some fresh air. Um, there are choices that you have to what you do with that situation. So let's go on to the next one. Here are a couple of happiness practices that I like to put into play every single day. So this is another kind of Buddhist philosophy and uh, a lot of what came from my Vipassana 10 day silent meditation retreat is to be present to what is so. So I feel that we spend a lot of time making ourselves unhappy in life by either tripping out on stuff that happened to us in the past or worrying about something that's going to happen in the future, right? So we can get very disgruntled about, you know, some injustice that was done to us in the past. And a lot of people, you know, these are very legitimate. I'm not downplaying them at all. We, we have a lot of struggles in life. And maybe someone really harmed you or wronged you in the past. But it is in the past. It is over now. And, you know, your choice is what to do with it. And being present in the moment is one of the most powerful tools that we have for happiness. Because if we actually sit here... And we say, okay, this isn't the past. It isn't the future. I'm not worrying about what's going to happen now. I'm going to be right here in this moment. I'm going to tap into my body. Dr. Nelly noticed you saying your body's so powerful. What's going on in my body? What is my breath? Can I open and expand my breathing? Take a deep breath. Should we all try taking a deep breath together right now? It's amazing. It's mm. so powerful, that tool mm. of the breath. It's just, it's profound. Mm. It's like, it just brings you right in tune to, to where you are right now and realizing, oh my gosh, I'm alive. This is life right here, right now. What happened to me before, 
what happened to me in the future. It's right here, right now happening for me. And we, we tap into our body and we realize that this is this amazing gift. We aren't on this planet for very long. And the present is often quite wonderful, quite lovely. Did somebody something going with someone's phone? Sorry about that. I think I think that actually the Wiz IQ people were calling me because I was contacting them earlier to see why our course was starting 20 minutes late, but we're on track now. So sorry about that. Hopefully that won't continue. Um, so be present. Does anybody have any other ideas for how to be present? I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, breathing is really powerful for me. Um, so is going out in nature. I, I really find that a powerful experience. That's part of why I moved to the woods here in LA, so I could be closer to nature. I think um, going and looking at the ocean someone mentioned earlier was really powerful for them, going and looking at the sea, looking at the waves. Um, what else? Not multitasking. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Well, I love using all the senses. Yes, that is beautiful, Alicia. I love that. So, so we can really focus on tuning into what am I hearing right now? What am I observing, seeing? What am I tasting? Turn off your cell phone. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, taste is a really great meditation and being present. How many of us do you guys find yourself eating and you don't even like notice you're eating? You're like on your computer and you've got food next to your desk or you're in your car and you're eating or and you're not even noticing, you're just like putting this food in your mouth, right? Does anybody have a practice of of slowly in, like really being there and being with their food and enjoying the taste and the texture and chewing and noticing? Oh my gosh, it's it's so amazing. Um Slowly enjoying food is really powerful, and it's so great. Not watching TV, exactly. Not reading. A sunset, a child's laughter. Wonderful. These are such wonderful ideas. How about um, how about just really being with a loved one, like really being present with your loved one? Pets are wonderful, so powerful and so profound. These are a wonderful ideas about how to be present, how to be present. Kids, being around children, do any of you have children, being with children, they're so present. They're just totally tuned into the moment and what is going on right now, exactly. So great. So that is one happiness practice. Um, okay, so Sharon would like to talk about accepting when loved ones die, our feelings of rejection. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so there are um, things that happen to us in life that we don't like and that upset us, and that that leads us right into happiness practice number two. So, I'm so glad you guys brought up kind of some of these these deeper issues that we face. I love the Serenity Prayer. I think it's attributed to Alcoholics Anonymous here in the U.S., but um, I think it's valuable for absolutely everyone on the planet. Uh, whether you believe in God or not, I, it, it doesn't matter, but it's this idea of, you know, there is there is perhaps something just beyond us, a power that is higher than us, a greater power than us. And um, the prayer is, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So here we have one of the most powerful happiness practices. I really feel like this is so critical in life. Um, the death of a loved one or someone rejecting us. These are terrible, difficult, challenging life events. And we all will face them. I mean, the Buddha said, life is suffering. That is you know, the noble truth number one. And again, you don't have to be a Buddhist. Um, I think of it as a philosophy as much as a, of, of a religion. I grew up Christian, um, so I'm welcoming all different religious positions here. But I think the philosophy is, you know, that life is suffering. There is a lot of pain out there. So finding happiness in life does not mean avoiding the pain. On the contrary, I think that many of the happiest people I know are the people who embrace and accept the pain and the suffering as much as the joy and the happiness. And they're okay with allowing the pain and suffering to arise. When we lose someone, that's a time when pain and suffering is gonna arise. There's no avoiding it. And rather than trying to avoid it, this is one of the biggest mistakes I think so many people make. They try to avoid it. And how do they avoid it? Do you guys, can you guys give me some, 
some ideas of some of the ways in which people try to avoid pain and suffering. You know, I'll give you one. Um, one obvious one is is with substances, right? We 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 get we start drinking, doing drugs, alcohol, um, sex, um, losing ourselves in like some kind of crazy passionate relationship. We numb ourselves. TV, Mary says TV, absolutely. Blaming others, good one, Sebastian. Yeah, we turn, we turn to blame, and we look at like, look at what life has done to me. Look at what these people have done to me. Um, I'm unhappy because my parents, because my ex-husband, because my children, because my boss. Right. So, how to obtain self empowerment? How do we lift ourselves out? Okay, yeah, substance abuse, absolutely. You lost yourself. So what are some of the other ways that, yeah, people lose themselves? In comparison, that's a good one too, right? We're each on our own journey. Um, wanting something not to have happened. So, so the, the serenity prayer is really great, Sharon, I think, because what it is is that kind of, okay, well, when something terrible happens, this is something I can't control. I know I cannot control. I have no control over the fact that some people are going to hurt me, some people are going to leave me, some people are going to die. That's life. So when it happens, what is my reaction to it going to be? That is my choice. So I have the courage to change the things I can. What I can control is, is what, what I do with that. And allowing yourself to be unhappy and allowing yourself to suffer and feel pain, I think is really healthy. I actually think it's one of the keys to happiness. And that might seem a little counterintuitive, but I think running away from it, numbing ourselves in substance abuse or in TV or movies and just ignoring it and trying to get away from it, it's 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 easier in the short term, but in the long term, it's not going to serve us. What's going to serve us is allowing it to be. And I think some ways that we can allow it to be, that's like, how do you help others? This is so critical, right? So... Um, Reaching out and being vulnerable. So let's talk a little bit about this. So here are some more of my suggestions for now that we've kind of gotten on this track. Okay, so we have things we can control. We have things we can't control. We're going to try and work harder on accepting what we can't control. And we're going to try, we can change things that we can't control. And we're going to work on being present, accepting, going through the darkness, and, and coming to the other side. One of the most powerful ways to do this, I feel, is through a mind-body connection. So I think a lot of us can get very caught up in our head. And, um, you know, we're a very kind of intellectual world that we live in. We're very focused on, you know, um, on what we're doing and accomplishing. But it's so powerful to spend time being in your body. And uh, you know, some people are asking about self-empowerment. They're asking the question about how do we empower ourselves? I think getting in touch with our body is a really powerful way to empower ourselves. Do any of you guys have that experience of getting in touch with your body and having that kind of empower your mind? I did and I started doing yoga. So I started practicing yoga over 10 years ago. I think it was about 12 or 13 years ago now. And yoga for me was amazing. I've always been really nerdy, really in my head, like a very brilliant student. I had no connection with my body. It was like my body was just this vehicle for getting my brain around. And when I started doing yoga, I suddenly realized, Lisa at least says me too, and Jagger also. Yoga, oh my gosh, suddenly I realized I have this body and it's beautiful and amazing. Running, I think all kinds of exercise. You want to know how to change your bad habits? Wow. Pilates, yoga, stretching. Yeah. Get in touch with this body. This body we have is this amazing gift. It's such an amazing, amazing way to just realize that we breathe and we're alive. It makes you want to be healthier. Tips for starting yoga. Okay. There are so many great ways to start yoga. Um, you can do yoga online. I bet Wiz IQ has some online yoga courses. If not, there are places like Yoga Glow and My Yoga Online. There are online yoga studios, and they're really inexpensive. You can pay a very low monthly fee, basically like $15, $20 a month, which is the equivalent of one class in Los Angeles. I don't know how much you guys pay, but one class will be $15, $20. And you can do, um, here, I'll type this in. I know a couple are Yoga Glow 
and my yoga online. And then there are a lot of people who do free podcasts. So I would check for a yoga podcast. Um, there we go. Some people are sending links. Thank you guys for, for offering links. Um, and you can just start doing it in the privacy of your own home. You don't have to be embarrassed that way. Um, and, and you can just start start trying it. And you can do different lengths of classes. So you can try like a 15-minute class or a half hour or an hour, an hour and a half, however much you have time to do. But I really recommend getting in touch with your with body as a way to find happiness in everyday life. And there are lots of ways to do it. It doesn't have to be yoga. Yoga is just one way um, that I have found because I just love the breath work. I love the spiritual element of it. It's very focused on being positive and being present. Um, but there, are, there are many, many other practices. A lot of people love running, surfing, swimming. Um, I'm sure there are lots of other ideas out there. Feng Shui, yeah, Qigong is beautiful practice. Um, so that's one way to really empower yourself. Thank you so much for sharing some of those ideas. You guys are great. You're so helpful as a community. I love how you support each other. Okay, here's another happiness practice. Let's move on to the next one. Other people. Like, we get so alone in our suffering, you know? And we, a lot of us have a tendency to really isolate ourselves and we stop reaching out to other people. But other people want to help us. And know how you find the people who want to help you is by being authentic and being vulnerable. So instead of, you know, trying to always show off and be like, oh, I'm so happy and things are so great and everything's going so smoothly, what if you were to actually really connect with people in an authentic way and you share with them the joys in your life? Absolutely, you share with them the things that are going well. You share with the things that you're excited about, your work projects, your family, whatever it is that's exciting to you, but you also share the things that are challenging for you. What is challenging for you? What are the things that you're struggling with? And not be afraid that people are going to judge you, but find the people who don't judge you. Find the people who react with compassion and love and uh, are eager to be there to support you. And there are lots of those people out there in the world. And you know what I find is so toxic people, bye-bye. Absolutely, Elena, thumbs up to that. And... I really, really um, cannot recommend highly enough the fact that once you start being vulnerable and authentic with other people, you will also find that they will be authentic and vulnerable with you. And they will start to share with you what's going on with them. And then one of the most powerful ways to find happiness in everyday life is to support other people and to help other people and get outside of yourself. Stop getting so, you know, churned up we like get in this trap where we're just so you know caught up in what's going on for us and our problems and our world and 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 i'm totally compassionate to that i've been there myself like it, it happens to all of us and it ends up being a really selfish place almost and it's like oh my gosh where there are all these other people they can all help me and not only that but i can help them and when you start helping other people oh my gosh it is like talk about getting out of your loneliness Talk about getting out of your suffering, connecting with others, volunteer, find a place where you can help out, um, find people who you can help out, and you will find that you have you find so much joy in serving others and in helping others. I really, really believe this. So does, do any of you have a practice of volunteering or um, helping others in any way? It could be at a church or at a, at a religious group. It could be you know, at your kid's school, it could be anything. Tame, you said I do. I would love to hear what some of your, uh, Sharon, you volunteer. Yeah, you love helping people you do volunteer work, helping family and friends absolutely count, helping disabled people, wonderful, wonderful. I mean, this is like such a great way to get out of, you know, myself, my problems, what's wrong with my life. I help addicts, a spiritual, wonderful, wonderful. These are great ideas. And do you guys find that when you're helping others and when you're volunteering, when you're doing things for other people, it, it reduces your own suffering and helps you get away from your own suffering? People in hospice, wow, Sharon, that's amazing. Absolutely. It gets you out of your head. Yep, yep, exactly. Working with an NGO, fantastic. Oh, you guys are great. It does make you happy. It makes you happy to serve others. 
and it, it, it immediately gives you that that connection and this realization that we're all one we're all going through the same thing in this life we all are dealing with suffering we all have loss we all have pain you teach math for free jagger that's awesome God, you guys are great. You're so inspiring. I just love hearing all of these beautiful ideas. So that is another happiness practice. Um, and then this is going to be my last slide. This is my mantra, and it is fear less, love more. So I think that one of the keys of happiness is um, getting away from fear and moving from a fear-based place around the world. So what is a fear-based place? A fear-based place is one where we see everything as scarcity, where we worry that there's not enough for us. Um, and instead, we choose to see that the world is a very abundant place. And we know that we have the option to create the opportunities that we want in our life. And um, I do believe that um, fear serves a purpose. Fear, I mean, there's the kind of fear from like not jumping off the side of a mountain because it would kill us. <laughs> Um, so that's why I say fear less. I think a certain amount of fear can be a healthy thing. I think a little bit of fear can be, um, you know, just a cautionary way of telling us um, which way we should go in life. But, but generally speaking, fear gets in the way. Fear prevents us. It's fear of what are some of the fears that you guys find that interferes with happiness? I'll tell you one for me. Um, I, I think I had a lot of fear when I was younger of failure. And, um, you know, people talk about that a lot, but what does it mean? It was like, oh my gosh, if I try to write this book, you know, and people don't like it or whatever it is. Um, and, and I realized you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that I'm trying to be my best self in this world, that I'm trying to be the person that I was put on this world to be. And if I fail, I fail. And it actually took failing in a really big way <laughs> for me to realize that failure is not the end of the world. <laughs> That in fact, I could fail and I could pick myself up and recover. Um, fear of success. Jagger, I'd love to hear more about that. I think that's really interesting. Um, fear can be used as a meter for asking myself what I need to do differently. Exactly. There are times when we fear and it's a sign that we're not on the right path, right? And we have to listen to that and pay attention. Where is that fear coming from? Why is it here right now? Um, fear of pain. That's a big one. Absolutely. Anxiety. So um, this is the end of my slideshow right now. Um, and I'd love to, I don't know, um, Nally, do you want to chime in for a second here? We say It says we have six minutes left. I don't know if you extended the class and it's going to go longer now. Um, but I would love to take some questions from people or hear a little bit more of your thoughts. You guys there? Anyone there? Thank you. Thank you for the claps and the thumbs up. You guys are awesome. Okay, I see a question here, so I'm going to answer it. And it's one that I have a lot of experience with. Sebastian said, how do I deal with anxiety? Okay, I have a ton of experience with this myself. Um, I like to say that I think people go up, down, or sideways. Um, going up means we get anxious. Going down means we get depressed. Going sideways means we kind of go a little crazy. Thank you guys all for the wonderful, wonderful thank yous and comments. Um, okay, and I will get to your question about fighting. Thank you, Noan. Let me get back to that, fighting with your family members and professionally. But let's start with anxiety. So I, I've suffered a lot from anxiety in my life. I tend to be a go-up anxious person. And uh, I, I, I know I might sound like a broken record a bit on this, but meditation was the most valuable technique I have learned for coping with anxiety. Nothing comes close to it. And when I did my 10-day silent Vipassana meditation retreat, and I'm going to send you that link again for any of those who might have missed it. There it is. Um, I, it, it, was, it was the most powerful thing I've ever done. I was really suffering a lot from anxiety at that time, and I, was, I had terrible insomnia. I wasn't able to sleep. Um, I would kind of fall asleep, then I'd wake up, and I'd be up for hours. And uh, you have that too, Sebastian. Okay, yeah, other people have dealt with anxiety. I literally got to the point where I couldn't have a good night's sleep unless I took an Ambien or a Xanax or some kind of prescription medication, which I hated. Um, and I would only do that every so often, but then I'd just get so tired and that would make me more anxious. And um, yeah, to me, it felt like not being able to sleep was one of the primary indications. Um, it, 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 discomfort in the stomach. Um, you haven't taken any medications. Okay, good. 
um, it's really, it can be really challenging. And um, I felt like just super stressed all the time, almost shaky, um, a little bit shaky. Um, and uh, some people even get panic attacks, like where they have trouble breathing. So what I found with my Vipassana meditation retreat was this awareness of impermanence and a willingness to invite in even the negative emotions was really powerful. So uh, instead of trying to avoid the anxiety, what I was always doing was trying to push it away and get rid of it and be like, oh, I don't like this feeling. I don't want to feel it. So I'm just going to push it away. And, uh, and Sharon, you said you're dealing with that too, due to death. Um, instead, I invited it in. I literally created a character in my head that I called Screechy. Screechy was my little anxiety buddy in my meditation course that I did. And I pictured him. I like knew what he looked like. He's like kind of green with these big eyes and long fingers and long fingernails that he like screeches on the chalkboard. And instead of being like, oh my God, there comes Screechy. What am I going to do? I'm not going to be able to sleep. Oh, no, no. I instead invited him and I literally created like a cartoon character of Screechy and I could feel him coming up. I could feel like his shadowy presence and getting his fingernails into me. And I said, hey, Screechy, why don't you come sit with me? Come sit with me. Let's talk. What's going on? Why are you here? Why are you showing up? And it was like, oh, I get it. It was scary, but it's scary. But it's like, oh, then suddenly Screechy went from being this scary, shadowy figure that I was trying to push away and shut out like a monster when you're a kid that's hiding under your bed to a friend. I made Screechy a friend. I really did. And I said, okay, I know you're here for a reason. I know you wouldn't show up if there weren't a purpose. So what are you trying to tell me? And, you know, what Screechy told me is like, oh, I'm so worried about the future. What's going to happen next? Like, am I going to find a partner? Am I going to have a family of my own? Am I going to make it as a, as a writer and a coach and all these things? And I would talk about it. I would talk about it with Screechy and be like, okay, well, here's what's going on. Here's what we're doing to work on it. This may happen. That may happen. But let's just be here now. What's going on right here now? Life is good. We're sitting on this meditation session. We're breathing. We're getting out in nature. We're looking at flowers. And it was really powerful to just make Screechy a friend. And so I, I really recommend that to any of you who are struggling with negative emotions, whether it is um, anxiety or depression, either one, is instead of just trying to push it away all the time, to invite it in, sit with it, ask it what it's there to tell you, because it's there for a reason, right? And Rumi has a beautiful poem called The Guest House. If any of you can find a link to it and share it, I really appreciate it. It's called This Human Being is a Guest House, right? And we make room for, for everyone to come in. And sometimes they're clearing the space for wonderful new joys and pleasures to arrive. And that's what I found. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next question. Thank you, Sebastian, or someone's gonna find Rumi's poem, The Guest House, and share it with us. Someone else asked about fighting. So let's talk a little bit about fighting and how that comes into play with happiness. So what do you guys, um, you find yourselves fighting about? You find yourselves fighting with, you're welcome, Sebastian, thank you. Um, with family members, with colleagues, like maybe one of you could, could give an example of, of, um, of something that you fight about. Um, so family. Okay. So what, you know, what is, what is really at the root of fighting? Is, is it a sense, is it a sense of like, I'm right. And the other person's wrong, right? Like I know what the right answer is, or I know what the right way to do this is. And the other person does. I think that's frequently at the core of what a fight is about, whether it's between family members or whether it's, you know, with a boss. It's like this sense of like, I'm right and you're wrong. And I think that one of the most important things in dealing with fighting is in just recognizing that everybody has their own life experience and everybody has their own perspective and everyone's coming from a place that is true for them. And so if we can start with, thank you so much, Jagger. I really appreciate your finding the guest house poem. Um, so it's like, okay, so I have this idea of what's right and why things need to be this way. But the other person has their idea of what's right and why things need to be this way. And probably everyone's valid and that everyone is coming from their own experience. Um, and so is there a way that you can take a little break? I think this is like the same thing we were talking about earlier about like you can't control your life, but you can control your response to it, right? 
So um, not to say you don't stay away. I, I don't think you stay away. I think what you do is, first of all, if you find yourself caught in a place where you are already fighting and you're really agitated and you're really angry and upset, it's, is number one to take a little, uh, take a break from it. <laughs> Dr. Nelly says avoidance will attract you to it. I agree. But you can take a break. And by a break, I just mean I think it's really valuable when you're fighting. I think it's hard to tap into your core of peace and compassion when you're in the middle of a fight. So if you can just the person who you're fighting with, if you can have five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and I think it's really valuable actually to just step away for a few moments. I'm not saying to step away and avoid a fight, but it's cool down, yeah, cool down. It's kind of like we give kids timeouts, right? It's it's like give ourselves a timeout. Give I have to give myself a timeout because I'll find myself like, again, notice body-mind connection. Someone said, take a deep breath. Exactly. So it's like, take a little break, step away from it for a moment. If you can, during that moment, get into your body. Anything that will get you into your body. Take some deep breaths. Take a little walk outside and look at the trees and the birds um, and the sky and the clouds. Uh, and just slow down a little bit. So you get out of that reactive mode. Because once we get into the reactive mode, it's very difficult to get out of it. So we have to like kind of step away and create ourselves a little space. And once we've tapped back into that, do a little meditation on compassion. So um, there's a really beautiful, you know, um, meta meditation um, from Buddhism that I really love, which is may all beings everywhere be happy and free. So I like to just kind of repeat that mantra to myself. May all beings everywhere be happy and free and remind myself, okay, wait a second. This isn't about me being right. It's not about me winning. It's not about me proving anything. What it's about is us connecting in an authentic and vulnerable way. So once you come back into the conversation, someone Lee said, learn to actively listen. Absolutely. I think um, a great step when you come back together with the other person is to each have a chance to state what is going on for you and speak from your own experiences. It's not about blaming. It's not about you did this, you did that. It's I, I statements, right? I'm feeling, what am I, what am I feeling? Um, what, you know, what I, I'm feeling hurt right now. I'm feeling upset right now. Um, I have a sense of, you know, what, what, what is going on for me in this moment? What is going on for me physically? And then you allow the other person to speak and share and you listen and, 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 and hear what they're saying. And without trying to get into a back and forth or proving who's right, who's wrong, just a really compassionate sharing and listening. Um, and I think that's the most powerful way of, of, of dealing with a fight. Um, if you guys have other ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, balancing the equilibrium between mind and body. Um, okay, so I see a question about mind and body. Um, well, I think we talked earlier about yoga. Um, yoga is very powerful for me uh, as a way to get in touch with my, my body. Um, but I think any form of exercise, I really am a huge, giant believer in exercise. I think we've all got to find something, whether it's yoga, whether it's walking, whether it's Qigong, um, whether it's Pilates, uh, that you've got to be in your body, you've got to be moving your body. It's so important. It's all about uh, physical health and longevity, but also mental health. It's so powerful for our brains to slow our thoughts down and give ourselves some breathing room um, to exercise. So that's what I would recommend on that front. There are other questions that you guys have? Okay, Success asks, what are strategies for finding the job that makes you most fulfilled, the one that you're meant for? Great, great question. Um, so, I would start with finding out what are you, what is your passion? What is like, what makes you tick? What fires you up? What makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? What is the most exciting thing that you could imagine doing with your day? And you start with your passion and what gets you excited. And then you move to finding the job that matches that. Um, I think there are probably a bunch of courses on Wiz IQ, um, but there's a great book. Um, I will type it in here. It's a really old book, but they keep doing new editions um, in the U.S. It's called What Color Is Your Parachute? It is a fantastic book. It's like been, I think it's, this is the 30th year it's been in print. It is step-by-step step, takes you through a program for finding the job that suits you. 
best based on your passions and your skills and your strengths. Um, and it has tons of worksheets and workbooks. And, you know, I think uh, it's, it's really important to start with that and to start with kind of knowing yourself. Knowing yourself is, is the key, really, to finding a job that's a good fit for you. What do you enjoy? What are your passions? What are your strengths? We all have strengths and weaknesses. And, um, and, and then you go from there. Um, so I would re recommend that book. Um, what are the other questions that you guys have? Uh, a tough survival question? I missed that, Dr. Nelly. We talked a bit, Rhea, about coping with the death of a loved one. Um, I think Sharon had brought that up. Um, and I think the key to coping with death and hardship and suffering is really to start by accepting it and allowing it to come in um, rather than trying to avoid it. So, so rather than running away um, and, uh, you know, drowning yourself in sorrows, becoming an alcoholic, watching a lot of television, going out partying all the time, whatever your coping mechanism is, you allow the suffering to come in. You do that in a way that is um, also connected to other people. I think it's critical when you're coping with a death or suffering or trauma that you connect with others. You find people. And if you don't have people in your family who can support you, then you find a spiritual support group or some kind of community group um, that can support you during that time. But allow the grief to come in and know that it will pass. Know that it's impermanent. Know that it's not there forever. There will be a time when it's less. You might always feel sorrow and miss this person, but there will be a time when it won't control your life. Um, what else? Is there negative people in your Do we have a question going on around negative people in your life? Okay, sorry, I'm getting this like sunlight right on my face too. I'm trying to move out of it. Um, my, my, <laughs> someone said this, but I think it's really true. <laughs> I think it's important to get away from people who are toxic. Um, when we talk about the serenity prayer, do you guys remember that? Let's go back and look at that again. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I can not change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, let's not forget about the very important part of that puzzle, which is the courage to change the things I can. We haven't talked much about that. So let's talk a little bit about that. What does that look like? Are there times when our unhappiness in life is the result of external circumstances and we can do something about it. Yes, absolutely. This is true a lot of the time. So there are things we cannot change like the death of a loved one or someone abandoning us. What are the things we can change? We can change if we're in a relationship that's really unhealthy and unhappy for us. We can change if we're in a work situation that's really unhappy for us. And the courage to change things we can is an equally important part of this equation in happiness. There are things that we can change and we need to have the courage to do it. How do we know when that is something that, that is the case? How do we know that? Do you guys have a sense of like, oh, this is a situation? If you know you can change it, if you're in a job, if you're with a partner who puts you, degrades you, makes you feel bad, doesn't support your dreams, you need to get out of that partnership. If you're in a job where people put you down and criticize you and don't support you, you can get out of that. This is really, um, you have a choice and you can have the courage to change these situations. And you need to know when you are in a situation that you can change and you have the courage to change it and face our fears. Yeah, as Sharon says, you, you know, face our fears, our fear that we'll be alone, our fear that we won't find another job. Um, it's critical to get away from toxic, negative people. We need to surround ourselves with people who are compassionate and loving and supportive as much as we possibly can. It doesn't mean that we won't occasionally have a difficult person in a work situation or something, but we really can get ourselves out of relationships that are very poisonous. Dr. Nelly has some classes on mindfulness on Wiz IQ. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that would be really beneficial to a lot of people. Um, your options are to stay in a situation, accept that nothing will change, or leave the situation to make a new reality. So at least absolutely could not agree more with that statement. <laughs> You're not going to change another person. That's another key to happiness, right? You're, you can't change another person. You can change your situation, get away from that person, or you can accept it. Um, many YouTube videos on mindfulness, great. Some people are manipulative. Some people have two faces, okay? We can't change others, right? So um, if we recognize and notice that someone is two-faced or someone is manipulative, what are our choices? One is to 
realize that and accept it and say, okay, I have no choice. This person's in my life, so I'm just going to be wary and I'm going to avoid them as much as I possibly can. And the other is to get away from them completely. Those are your choices. Again, you have control over that. You may not have control over some negative people in your life, but you have, you have control over what to do about it. You, you can't remove yourself from them entirely. You can minimize your contact with them. If you can't minimize contact with them, you can be aware that that's how, the, that, that, that's how they're going to be, and you can come with them to them with love and compassion and really um, be realistic about who they are. Um, some people have more than two faces. Great point, Dr. Nellie. Um, any other questions, you guys? I think we're, we have, what it says now, eight minutes left. The child has a dream, but their parents don't support them. Should a child keep striving for that dream or give up is the question. Wow. Well, I absolutely believe that you have, if you have a dream, you have to go for it. And even if people in your life don't understand um, someone, find the people who do. Um, I really think that, thanks so much for attending. I really appreciate it. Fight for the dream, as Elena says. I couldn't agree more. You've got to. That's what life is about, right? We all have our dreams. Um, so I'd like to go back to something we were talking about right at the beginning, um, which is the idea of finding joy in your everyday life. Um, and I want to just point you one more time to this blog, which is 40 ways to find joy in your everyday life. So I just want to return to this. We were talking about this at the beginning. Um, but it wasn't with the video and the audio. It was just when I was typing um, when we started a few minutes late. And I just want to say that one of the most crucial ways to be happy in everyday life is to practice being happy. And it sounds kind of silly, but it is a practice. And I really think that um, if you just make a commitment to being happy every day, you will find ways that you can and you turn it into a practice and the practice makes it a habit and the habit makes it a reality that sticks with you for life. And uh, this happiness practice, this joy practice, that blog I sent you had a bunch of ideas. I'm sure you guys could probably generate 150 more ideas in the next 10 seconds about ways to find joy in your everyday life. We were talking a bit about it a bit at the beginning, but if anybody wasn't here or wants to chime in again, what are ways that you find joy in everyday life? Nellie had mentioned flowers. Um, for me, pets, I, I have a dog. I love spending time with my dog. Um, taking my dog for a walk, petting my dog is such a great way to find joy. Um, I think being very playful, I like to do things like skip when I get a shopping cart uh, and I go out to the, the parking lot afterwards with my groceries. I jump on the shopping cart and ride it <laughs> like a ride in an amusement park. Um, I um, like to skip. I like to sing out loud. Um, nature, nature is such a fabulous way. Knitting. Um, what are some other ideas that you guys have for joy in everyday life? Cooking. Do you guys love to cook? Does anyone love to cook? Um, flowers are wonderful. What painting? I love painting. How beautiful. Dancing, singing, the sky. Um, these are beautiful, wonderful ideas. Spending time with friends. Absolutely. Um, gardening. Oh, wonderful, wonderful ideas. Thank you, guys. So, yeah, take a walk. So make it a practice. Just commit to it. Let's commit to it right now. Does anybody want to commit right now to having a daily joy practice with me? And one of the ways that you can join me um, is you can use the hashtag 40 Days of Joy. Um, if you use Twitter or Facebook and um, that hashtag, I'll be able to connect, especially on Twitter. I'll be, I can retweet you and um, support you in your daily joy practice. Um, when you're mindful, yeah, mindfulness is so critical. I'm so glad to hear you have courses, Dr. Nelly, on mindfulness. Um, looking at the stars. Yay, Tom May says I'm in. Reading, reading is a great one. So let's commit. Let's like say, I'm just going to make a practice of happiness. How am I going to find more happiness in life? I'm going to make a practice of being happy every day. I'm going to smile. I'm going to find something to be happy about. Gratitude is huge. I'm going to write that one down too. I think a gratitude practice is vital. Um, drinking. <laughs> okay, that's probably not going to be um, the most long-term beneficial happiness practice. 
Um, does anybody have a gratitude practice? Like, do you guys keep a gratitude journal or anything like that? I have an app on my phone that's a gratitude app that was free. And I write down five things every day that I'm grateful for. And it could be anything from, you know, a beautiful flower that I saw on my morning walk to a wonderful cup of coffee to spending time with family to having an amazing conversation with someone I love. Laugh your head off. <laughs> Dr. Millie could not agree more with that. Laughing, watching a funny video, um, our favorite comedian. Um, so um, gratitude is, is really critical. I think um, two keys of happiness. One is gratitude, being grateful for what we have, just being so appreciative. And second is um, service, helping others, getting outside of our health selves. Um, worship is a good one. Connecting with God is very powerful. Um, yeah, these are all wonderful ideas. Some meditation practices. Thank you guys. Movies, a favorite old movie is great. Um, so I wish you guys so much luck. I think we just are winding up to the end here. Um, I think on my last page, like it has my contact info, but I will leave it with you guys. So you can reach me on Facebook. You can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, you can reach me on Twitter. You can visit my website. Um, uh, and this rat asked if you can watch the course again. Um, Dr. Nelly, is the course going to be available afterwards for people to? Yeah, the recordings the um, will be available. Before it was over. And you can also click on the links in the chat uh, during the recordings, um, and they're they're active. And I'm also recording this for YouTube. If anybody's interested, um, I'll share that with you. Oh, awesome. yes. <laughs> one of the things that I do. Um, it makes me happy. <laughs> I do no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I think it's nice uh, to be able to share uh, these videos around. So um, you're welcome Great. to... And I really encourage that. Yeah. And, and if you're share. interested in the I link... Share. Yeah. If you're interested in the... Um, uh, that's for you, uh, maybe. If you're interested in the... Um, uh, in the file, the uh, video file, I can also get that to you. Maybe, you know, you can play around with it uh, or get someone. Oh, thank to you. Yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to do that. I was going to create a course for WizIQ on your suggestion. So, yeah. Yeah, that would be great. great. Uh, how many people would like to take a course with uh, our presenter, with Mamie? Give us oh, a, oh, look at that. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So get your thumbs okay. up there. And I really um, want to thank yeah, I really want to thank you all. You were just an amazing group. I, I feel so blessed, really. You, you really inspired me. You had wonderful questions, wonderful ideas, wonderful support of each other. It was, it was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, there's something magical. I don't know if you noticed it, but I think there's something magical uh, in, the, in these live uh, meetings. Imagine, you know, you're, you're communicating with people from around the globe people that you would never normally have had a chance to touch or be touched by. So uh, I think that's amazing. That's something that we should be grateful for. And uh, if you want to start with practicing reasons to be happy, I think it's just the fact that we're here together. Hello, Davey from Australia. I don't know what time it is there. I mean, it, you know, if you could just add where you're from again. I know you did at the beginning. But just so we can kind of yeah, I was spin around the world. The I think we had, <laughs> yeah, we had every single continent. Like, it was amazing. Yeah, please share. Hungary. Wow, look at oh, this. Hello, wow. Tom. Amazing. Oh wow. So incredible. Yeah. Oh. Senegal. I mean, like, I mean, imagine we're traveling. <laughs> Syria. I mean... We wouldn't be able to get into the, some of these countries, you know. We, we, they they would just not accept us. Oops. All right, that stopped very quickly. Sorry about that. 